Resuming debate, the Honourable Member for Beaches, East York. Thanks, Madam Speaker. At the outset, I just want to thank every constituent in Beaches, East York, and every Canadian across our country who has stepped up in these difficult times, whether it is essential workers in frontline healthcare, in our grocery stores and our food supply chains, whether it is our teachers, whether it is individuals looking after loved ones. Uh, just a sincere thank you to everyone who has stepped up uh, and, and made a difference in, in these really difficult times. Now, we have seen in the course of the throne speech, uh, I think a comprehensive set of old commitments from the 2019 platform mixed with uh, a set of new commitments that respond to lessons learned in the course of this pandemic. And I wanna focus in on those lessons learned and what we can glean from the throne speech in answer to those lessons. And first, it's important that we recognize that we face an economic crisis because of the health crisis and that the best economic response is also a public health one. And in the short term, that means a massive rapid testing program. And in the long term, that fundamentally means a vaccine. And in the throne speech, we see our government commit to do everything it can to see rapid tests deployed upon approval. And with respect to a vaccine, notes that Canada has already secured access to vaccine candidates and therapeutics while investing in manufacturing here at home. Now, second, our social safety net wasn't fit for purpose for millions of Canadians. When we look at the CERB numbers, almost 9 million unique applications, almost 9 million Canadians received income support in a time of need. Our social safety net, specifically employment insurance, was not fit to answer this crisis. Now, our government's new EI recovery benefit will ensure that most people are supported in the coming months, in the coming six months. And that's important because there was a lot of angst, I think, from people who were worried that the serve was going to end. And they now know that they're going to receive supports through the EI system in the months ahead. But fundamentally, we need a permanently strengthened social safety net. And I would argue, and I've, I've pushed in within caucus and outside of caucus for a, a permanent minimum floor below which nobody will fall in, in our society. In a wealthy country like ours, we should not have the power poverty levels that we do. Now third, essential workers. We, I, I mentioned at the outset, uh, I need to thank essential workers, but we have to do more. We need to protect essential workers. And that fundamentally means ensuring that there is leadership. I, I know provincial minimum wages matter more than a federal one, but we should lead through a federal minimum wage as we committed to do in 2019. I think also behooves us to ensure that we work with provinces for portable benefits. And fundamentally, where there is federal jurisdiction like competition laws, we should ensure that we are updating our comp uh, competition laws to address wage fixing. As we, we've seen concerns recently, and certainly I saw concerns myself through my work on the industry committee, where our national grocers communicated directly about the prospect of ending pandemic pay premiums of frontline workers. We also need to recognize when we look at our migrant workers and those who are so often our essential workers, whether on farms or in healthcare settings, we need to ensure that we are protecting migrant workers and ending the systemic exploitation of migrant workers. And that fundamentally means prioritizing permanent res residency through immigration work programs. When it comes to the throne speech, we see language that says, we own immense debt to those who served and still serve on the front lines earning the lowest wages in the most precarious sectors on the front lines of the pandemic, and also noting that Canadian and migrant workers who produce, harvest, and process our food deserve the government's full support and protection. Fourth, a lack of supportive housing has undermined isolation efforts, and existing supportive housing, especially for-profit nursing homes, has failed our seniors. Now, we need more supportive housing, but also national standards for nursing homes and fundamentally increased staff and training levels with a focus on nonprofit care. In the throne speech, we see a commitment to a conversation with provinces about national standards for our nursing homes. We see a commitment to targeted measures for personal support workers to provide increased supports. Language that says no one should be without a place to stay during a pandemic or even in a Canadian winter. And a reference to a recent $1 billion announcement focused on eliminating chronic homelessness. And importantly, when we talk about old commitments and new commitments, there is an important new commitment in this throne speech to ending the chronic homelessness in our country. Fifth, the economic fallout has disproportionately affected women, and we know that childcare is a significant answer. Now, our federal government has taken important steps over the last five years to support childcare, but we need to build on these efforts. And in the throne speech, we see a commitment to build on these efforts. We see 
an acknowledgement that we must not let the legacy of the pandemic be one of rolling back the clock on women's participation in the workforce. Canadians need more accessible, affordable, inclusive, and high quality childcare, and the government will make a significant long-term sustained commitment to create a Canada-wide early learning and childcare system. Also important to note that there is a renewed attention to before and after care and an acknowledgement that flexible care options for young children are more important than ever. Sixth, the twin health and economic crises have disproportionately affected people of color, and we need to double down on our efforts to address systemic racism and reconciliation. Now, work to end poverty will make the biggest inroads. As an aside, Madam Speaker, in the course of this pandemic, I had the opportunity to spend a considerable amount of time reading and, and, and learning more on any number of different issues, but I read the last writing of Martin Luther King in 1967, uh, where do we go from here? And you know, more than 50 years ago, we have a, a leader focused on tackling racism, speaking about the need to end poverty. And so, of course, we need criminal justice reform, but we also need to focus on our social safety net, not only a matter of justice for essential workers, not only a matter of justice for people in, in poverty, but also if we're serious about addressing systemic racism. We also need to focus on reconciliation. And we, we see in the throne speech an acknowledgement that we need to keep moving even faster, an acknowledgement that we are going to work towards a national action plan for missing and murdered Indigenous women, that we're going to have UNDRIP legislation before the end of the year. We're going to continue work to close the infrastructure gap and to make sure there's clean water in every community. I think we also, frankly, and I said this in answer to the first throne speech, but I'll reiterate it again, we need more attention to our urban Indigenous communities because we know here in Ontario, over 80% of Indigenous Canadians live in our urban centres. Seventh, we've listened to public health experts to save lives in this pandemic, and we need to, we need to continue to heed their advice to address the opioid epidemic. Now, that work should include a federal task force to reset our national drug strategy that has been called for by police chiefs and action towards decriminalization and safer supply projects. We have seen so many different voices, public health experts across our country call for this conversation, police chiefs call for this conversation, the Chief Justice of Ontario call for this conversation, people who have lost loved ones call for this conversation. Every serious person who has looked at this issue says the current drug prohibition framework is killing people and we need drug policy reform to save lives. And I hope we have a serious conversation and we put the politics aside to save lives going forward in the same way we have put politics aside in the course of this pandemic. Eighth, our government can respond quickly and successfully to a crisis with determination. And we need that same level of determination brought to a green recovery and the climate crisis. Now, the throne speech rightly acknowledges that climate action will be a cornerstone of our plan to support and create a million jobs across our country. And we need great action through the retrofits announced in the throne speech to the clean vehicle support announced in the throne speech and so much more to make sure we get to net zero by 2050 to make sure we exceed and, and have stronger science-based 2030 targets and to make sure that we have effective climate accountability legislation to set five-year carbon budgets to take those long-term targets and to turn them into short-term practical action. Ninth, infectious diseases represent an incredible threat to our collective well-being, and we need to be proactive in order to prevent the next pandemic. I would argue Public Health's Center for Emergency Preparedness and Response should issue a public assessment of how Canadian activities domestic and abroad contribute to pandemic risk and then tell us how we can take steps to reduce those risks. I, I had the luck to speak to Dr. Jane Goodall recently, and she made it very clear that this pandemic is at least in part because of the way we have disrespected our planet and animals. And we need to, we need to reconsider and reset how, how we treat both our planet and animals as it relates to pandemic risk. Lastly, the pandemic isn't over 
and there will be more lessons to learn. This summer obviously offered us a reprieve, but as cold weather sets in and we move increasingly indoors, we need to maintain our bubbles strictly as much as we reasonably can. We need to keep physical distance with others, wear masks when distancing isn't possible. I, I just wanna close by thanking every single person in our community through the Michael Guerin Community Campaign who has sewn masks and helped distribute masks. Our office alone distributed 10,000 masks in, in, into our community, cloth masks into our community. So I wanna thank everyone for those efforts and I want to say the federal government will continue to be there in partnership with Canadian families and there in partnership with provinces to make sure we get through this pandemic and that we're there not only answering the economic crisis, but answering the health crisis. Questions and comments? The Honourable Member of Peace River, Westlock. Well, thank you, uh, Madam Speaker. And uh, to my Honourable colleague, thank you for his speech. Uh, I, I must say I was quite disappointed in the that speech from the throne, even while I thought I would di disagree with many aspects of it before I came out, I was expecting a little more fireworks and, uh, and big bold vision and we didn't see any of that. It was basically just a rehash of the, uh, of the 2019 throne speech. Um, so that begs the question, uh, what was the prorogation all about, um, Madam Speaker? Uh, was it truly necessary to prorogue? And the timing of the prorogation was very suspect. Uh, as it followed right on the heels of a large uh, document dump. And I'm just asking the honourable colleague uh, what he thinks uh, about the prorogation and the timing. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Member for Beaches East York. Well, I said at the time of prorogation that I would, have, I would have liked our committee work to continue, but I also didn't think that the outrage at the time was entirely warranted given we were really talking about losing weeks of committee time and a mere day or two of House time. But I do want to also respond to the member's suggestion that there was nothing new in the throne speech. Obviously, there are many emergency supports in this throne speech through EI extensions to help Canadians in need with income supports, the extension of the wage subsidy for businesses in need, but we also saw renewed commitments and new commitments, I would say, to childcare, to rapid testing, national standards in nursing homes, a commitment to end home chronic homelessness, and the scale of ambition has also been seriously amped up when it comes to climate action, when it comes to reconciliation, and of course, I would be remiss not to note that Given the high unemployment rate, our federal government seriously answered that concern with a, a one million jobs plan in this throne speech. Questions uh, The honourable member for Avignon, Lamitis Matan Matapedia. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I'd like to hear what my honourable colleague has to say about arts and culture. I come from a part of Quebec where it's a bit hard these days not just during a pandemic, but even in normal times for broadcasters, there's a lot of financial difficulties. And I was speaking to a broadcaster who said that the Heritage Canada assistance was laughable. They didn't even get 25% of the amount they would normally have gotten. And it might be better to have support based on box office. And so I was expecting something in the throne speech about support for cultural industries. Uh, what does my colleague think about this? Similarly to other industries like tourism and hospitality, many elements of arts and culture industry are going to have a very challenging time coming back in the short to medium term. Obviously, we aren't going to see large scale in-person events is but one example. And so the throne speech did commit to sector specific support for industries that are more deeply affected by the pandemic. And this is obviously a conversation that needs to continue and flow from that answer in the throne speech. Uh, we have time for a brief question. The honorable member for um, Fredericton. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Um, and I appreciated the, the speech by my honourable colleague, um, but I, I can't help but notice the kind of lack of enthusiasm in his voice when he's talking about some of these new promises. Um, so I'm just wondering, you know, how could I be so excited about this, this speech? Is there, is there something I'm missing? Is there something that for us to believe this time versus the 2019 speech? I'd just like to hear his thoughts on that. Thank you. The our member for Beach, Beach, Beaches East York has one minute to respond. <laughs> well, uh, don't let my working from home and the technology uh, suggest that there's any lack of, of enthusiasm for what we saw in the throne speech. I, I mean, I had enthusiasm for the 2019 throne speech as well. And as I say, we see a mixture of commitments, right? Of, of course, we want to carry through with gun control and pharmacare and other commitments from 2019. Of course, we want renewed commitments and faster action on, on all sorts of things, including on climate. And I would just end by saying on climate specifically, which is an issue I know we share a concern for, in, since 2015, we've seen projected 2030 
30 missions go from 815 megatons down to 592 megatons, a 25 percent reduction because of the climate action policies we've put in place so long as they hold and so long as we don't have conservative government heading into the future. And so we absolutely have to build on the, those efforts. I am absolutely committed to doing so. I know the federal government is committed to doing so, and I am enthusiastic about those commitments, but also delivering on those commitments, which I think is far more critical than the throne speech will be the work ahead in the fiscal update and the budget and more. Delivery is what matters.